Um, welcome everybody. My name is Megan Detmeyer. I'm the forestry extension educator here at Utah State University and I'm really happy to have Gene with us today. Uh, we've been trying to get him here for I think probably the last five months so I'm happy that he found some time to um, do a webinar for us today. Gene Phillips is a forest health specialist for the Nevada Division of Forestry. He's been in the position since the spring of 2014. He's responsible for the monitoring and management of insect and disease conditions on state and private lands within Nevada. He also assists the U.S. Forest Service with aerial surveys and he administers federal grant funds for the, the state of Nevada receives to implement projects on state and private lands. From 1993 to 2014, he was employed by the Idaho Department of Lands as a senior resource specialist. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Forest Resource Management from the University of Idaho, and he's also a certified arborist for the Nevada Division of Forestry. So thank you, Gene, for coming here today. Um, I'm really excited to have you. I'm excited that Heidi and, um, let me know about your great work, and um, I will turn it over to you, and we will take questions at the end. So again, as Mark said, put your questions in the Q&A pod um, at the bottom of your screen, and I will keep track of those and administer them either throughout the talk or at the end of Gene's talk. So don't forget to unmute yourself, Gene. Uh, well, welcome everyone. Sorry for the glitch there. Uh, appreciate Megan with the introduction and uh, just uh, with my background and everything. So I just want to also start proceeding into the presentation. So White Satin Moth in the Lake Tahoe Basin, uh, just a brief history. Um, it entered in the United States via British Columbia and spread south along the U.S. West Coast. R initially introduced in the early 1920s, and f it was first detected in Nevada uh, in the mid-1980s by the Nevada Department of Agriculture. So it's been around a while within the state. Uh, and it was known about, but not really presenting any real defoliation events in any of the native aspen stands or cottonwood stands throughout the, throughout the state. But however, in, 2011, it was roughly detected in the North Canyon area uh, in the Lake Tahoe, Nevada State Park, um, which is just outside of Carson City to the west of Carson City in the Lake Tahoe Basin. Um, from 2011 to 2016, uh, the moth did spread northward in that canyon, in North Canyon, as well as an area called Spooner Summit, which is immediately adjacent to the state park. Um, and uh, throughout that time, there's also was other reports of uh, satin moth throughout the state in different locations in central Nevada, northeast Nevada, north of Elko. Um, uh, defoliation during this time, though, um, they had some minor outbreaks with uh, some impacts being noticed uh, with the aspen trees, and they were refoliating. Uh, with a very minor amount of mortality, not, not too, too significant. Um, and defoliation really didn't exceed over 50% during this five year time frame in most of the stands that it was found in. Um, the 2017 outbreak, which is really more of a localized hotspot if you look at the, the Sierra Front Range, um, definitely a significant change in its population this year. Uh, I was contacted by one of the NDF's uh, foresters, um, you can see there, um, and he observed the increased satin moth presence and defoliation by mid-July. Um, and I started touring the sites with him and began some monitoring pro uh, protocols using some sticky pheromone traps um, and produced a forest pest alert update in mid-August mid of last year just to inform the public of what's going on and what they might be seeing out there in the landscape. Um, the foliation it was very severe at an area called Marlette Lake. It was greater than 75%. Uh, also as well as west of Hobart Lake, which is within three air miles of the Marlette Lake, and on the flanks of Snow Valley Peak. And these all fall within the state park, the Lake Tahoe Nevada State Park within the Lake Tahoe Basin. And uh, through Aerial mapping, aerial surveys, and ground checks uh, verified 226 acres alone in the state park um, being affected by the satin moth. Um, and during trapping, I was a little bit behind the curve, unfortunately, but I did ca uh, capture uh, 46 adult moths in a six-week uh, time frame. 
uh, egg mass counts in late August during their second phase of their life cycle um, showed at least 60 to 80 egg masses on every single aspen or cottonwood tree in the areas identified as heavier defoliation, um, which is quite high. Um, and that was just visual counting where I was looking at the stem of the tree that I could see about 15 feet up. So I'm sure there was many more egg masses that went uncounted, but that's just what I could see just physically from the ground. Um, and then the second hat caterpillar hatch was extremely heavy with corresponding defoliation. Uh, and almost every leaf that I looked at, there was over 15 to 20 caterpillars per leaf feeding. And I do have some photographs coming up that'll show that. This is just a map of the infestation area, what I'll call the hot spot or the outbreak. And in the green was minor defoliation, um, 10 to 50 percent, and moderate is in the yellow, uh, 10, 50 to 75 percent, and heavy heavy defoliation in the in the red. And this area showing the map is basically Lake Tahoe, the Nevada Lake Tahoe State Park, and just off the kind of the west of the map, that's actually Lake Tahoe proper itself. And what makes this significant? It's a uh, you know Lake Tahoe Basin is just a uh, it's a crown jewel of Nevada and Cal California, uh, just in its recreational aspects, its aesthetic beauty, and also related to how much recreation activity um, could be seen on this area, um, the defoliation could start causing problems with uh, continued defoliation with uh, just creating hazard tree issues with, along park infrastructures and throughout the, the basin itself. Uh, there's a great photo I have, a comparison coming up that just shows defoliation two different years and there's just no fall color. Um, this is just some of the tree canopy loss shots that I took uh, in August. Uh, on left side is greater than 75% and then on the right side photo would be 50 to 75%, just different locations throughout several stands in that area. Um, but just a uh, major defoliation going on. Uh, some additional photographs, just uh, the heavy caterpillar feeder, pillar feeding was the right around, uh, right after Labor Day, um, where it was every cat leaf had 15 to 20 caterpillars feeding on it. And this is, um, they're going into their second instar stage before they overwinter at this time but they're still feeding voraciously at the, at the current, at this time, uh, September of 2017. Again, just another defoliation shot, and then just cottonwood weren't spared as well. The photo on the right is just showing defoliation in cottonwood trees. Uh, it was just, uh, there was no differentiation between aspen or cottonwood. It was even affecting some of the native willow species around some of the riparian zones. So they were just feeding and, and almost running out of food source, just a level of uh, infestation and caterpillar hatch. Just a photo on the left, just a single adult moth. Um, it was a good shot um, in mid-August. And then right then after that, they had uh, laid their egg masses as well in late August, a little smaller white. It's a little hard to see in the photo, but in the center of the photo, you can see some of the white uh, egg masses that uh, the satin moth lay. And that's what I was seeing. And it just that's just one quadrant of the tree. Just imagine looking at all four quadrants of a tree and that's how you'd have that many egg masses and then make that, you know, and covering an entire tree uh, fairly significant. This is just a panoramic shot from across the Marlette Lake in mid-August. Um, in the area of the center of the photo, there's about 20% mortality. If you look really right in the center of that foliation, there was about 20% mortality already. Basically, I was walking in there and I, there was no leaves on the trees and I really, and being late August, I have, I kind of measured some ground area and I came up with 20% for that stand. Uh, I just don't think it's going to come back. And if they do, it's going to be very, very minimal foliation this year. And um, 
we'll see some mortality. Luckily, it was interior and it wasn't right adjacent to the recreation area. It's actually a campground. So, and here's just a great comparison photograph uh, taken by a co coworker from that works for the Nevada Department of Fish and Game. Uh, he had a photo that he took in uh, October of 2015 as compared to October 5th of 2017. And that previous slide showing the campground and the water, well, this is the same stand we're looking at, and you can see there is just no fall color whatsoever in the main stand and even in some of the scattered uh, aspen and more in the foreground of the fir uh, first picture, picture in 2015. It's just the defoliation eliminated any fall color because there just wasn't any leaves left to uh, you know, start uh, dropping off the trees and, and turning color. So uh, I anticipate continued heavy defoliation in this stand, so. And just um, damage impacts and effects. You know, this, this presentation I'm giving right now was initially, I uh, created it for the, what we call the Tahoe Resource Team with its uh, a partnership among the different state land management agencies within Nevada which includes state parks, state lands, uh, fish and game, um, and along with the Nevada Division of Forestry that work with managing within state lands within the, the Tahoe Basin. And I gave this presentation to them and this is what they were most concerned about, what kind of damage impacts and effects. And just basically I know just from my experience with it so far, it's gonna continue to spread throughout the basin and in Nevada. Um, but definitely within the basin. Um, that's where the majority of our aspen stands are um, closest to this infestation, but there's other lands throughout the state, mainly on national forest lands, that um, it'll be affecting those stands as well. Uh, continued defoliation will cause a mortality event of some kind and create some major hazard tree problems for that state park and likely other recreation areas within the basin, you know, ski areas, um, just city parks uh, within Lake Tahoe itself. Um, it also will create uh, problems and predisposed trees to other insect and diseases potentially in the future, uh, just causing the stress and the weaknesses in the stand, uh, and loss of ecologically important aspen and hardwood stands in the basin and in Nevada. We, we all know how important Aspen stands are in the Intermountain West, and this is something we just don't want to lose. Um, additional damage or effects, loss of wildlife cover, and even potential songbird habitat. Basically, you're walking into stands that had 100% crown closure and canopy shade on the on the forest floor, and now there's there, it's gone. And along with that, the habitat for just you know wildlife and songbirds. And, which is uh, something that Endow has a major concern over, our, which is our fishing game agency. Uh, again, loss of tree canopy shade, since these are close to some lakes and riparian zones, uh, we all know the importance of shade and helping control stream temperatures and water temperatures for water bodies, and just that also could lead to issues for fish populations. Um, loss of tree stands, in the area here could also lead to just future uh, potentially erosion problems because um, some of the stands are right next to some existing old roads or mountain biking trails and there could be just some issues with the erosion problems as well. And then uh, for state parks, the especially the Nevada Lake Tahoe State Park, just safety issues for a very high use recreation area. The state park there I don't have a, a visitor count, but it's one of the highest use recreation areas in the state of Nevada and California. Um, so you can imagine if you have a, a lot of dying trees along mountain biking and hiking trails, you're going to have potential for, for major hazard trees and issues with uh, people getting hurt or just causing the park to close certain areas until they can mitigate the hazards. Um, and then just like the previous one of the photos showed, the loss of fall color, uh, which the public enjoys on a yearly basic basis, uh, 
less visitation in the fall, just to go look at fall colors. Um, just simple, simple things as that. Um, and the list can go on and on. I, this is just a really short list, but uh, during that meeting that I've held, and just uh, there's more that we could add to this list. And uh, 2018 predictions. Um, I feel it's going to continue to spread in Ash and King Canyon, which I know not everyone knows where we're talking, but that's just uh, east of the Lake Tahoe Basin, actually going off the Sierra Front Range and, and coming down into the Carson City area. Um, that's my next uh, suspected areas that it could spread. Also, an area called Glenbrook, which is a major subdivision nearest to the state park, which has a lot of aspen in it. And it could just uh, spread into the stands there that are that the subdivisions are surrounded by, and then may also potentially spread into just landscape trees throughout the Tahoe Basin, um, or all the recreation, all the hotels, and just the town. The towns are out like South Lake Tahoe, Incline Village, Tahoe City. They're all all very close, within 10 to 15 air miles. Um, and then the areas where we're seeing the major defoliation, I uh, just see that with the caterpillar counts from last fall, I uh, just expect a continued heavy defoliation this year and tree mortality in the Marlette Lake, Hobart Lake areas, and an area right adjacent called Snow Valley Peak area. Um, again, it's hard to predict the population increase, all, but all the current indicators show a potentially large increase for 2018. And there is, you know, some good news. You know, there's some possibilities of a population crash. As many of us know, there's uh, uh, it's a common occurrence with defoliating insects. They have kind of a boom and bust population cycle. Uh, natural predators or just maybe weather conditions just cause a crash. But uh, there really isn't a good way to predict this. So. Uh, but those are the predictions that uh, I relate to our Tahoe resource team and also in different press releases throughout uh, the last uh, six months. And I'm keep, I've kept this presentation pretty short and sweet, uh, kind of a what's next, uh, control and management options, and I have one other slide past this, but uh, of course we'll continue trapping and monitoring of the population of the basin as well as Nevada and with time constraints, I still try to go visit stands that are on other state lands or private lands and, and national forest lands within Nevada to just, you know, get some ground truthing done um, to determine the spread. Um, really, we're, you know, kind of relying on other natural predators such as birds, um, predatory insects, as a rack, uh, certain wasps, certain flies that could also have potentially uh, feed on satin moths. Uh, there's also some introduced parasitic wasps introduced on the west coast that have spread, but there's no guarantee that these will help really control the population as the moth defoliates large areas, aspen and poplar and willow stands every year throughout the west. Um, there is potential, the ideas were thrown around, maybe doing some chemical insecticides such as carborol or, or so. So the uh, are labeled for the control of this pest, but they're usually applied best after the foliage lease out and caterpillars start to breed um, and feed. White satin moth caterpillars also can be controlled using a microbial insecticide containing a particular strain, Bacillus thuringiensis, so basically BTK. Um, provokes a disease that kills the larvae. Um, but again, something along that nature would require uh, more likely an aerial application. And you can't just spray on just the state land because it has spread on the federal lands. Um, but, but if we do anything joint venture wise, of course, anything on national forest lands would require a, you know, a NEPA document to be built before any type of project could be implemented, and that time frame usually is a year to 18 months in best case. So, you know, we'd have continued defoliation going on unless the population really decides to crash again. But uh, that is a potential idea. Uh, and then um, 
working with a new professor at the University of Nevada, Reno. Um, they put in for a, a evaluation and monitoring grant with the U.S. Forest Service uh, to look at the long-term effects of damage and end damage stands um, to the trees and wildlife soils and water quality. Um, and the next slide will kind of move into that as well. Um, Hey, Gene, so, somebody, somebody had a question about uh, foray, which you addressed, but what about di is it DIPEL, D-I-P-E-L? Um, right you know, now, I haven't looked at that one. These are the two, the couple that I listed here were the best for controlling, but uh, I'm still also talking to a couple different uh, pesticide companies, but it's really hard to tell the reaction if we did a major spray project of any kind you know, how the public will take it. Um, you know, if we do any type of project along this line, it would be a very big uh, public relations campaign and just letting know people we're not out there trying to poison the environment. We're trying to control an, a non-native insect. So, but I have not looked at that particular uh, pesticide. So, is there a follow-up to that? Nope, that's it, go for it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And then just, um, we just actually had a meeting that I participated in yesterday with the Tahoe resource team that we have. And, and we're working to set a course of action, some kind of action this year. And just this last slide addresses that. Of course, we're gonna, I'm gonna be doubling the monitoring and trapping locations to understand the population numbers and trends and the spread better locally here. Uh, I'm gonna be working with state park personnel to some, provide some insect disease training and identification training just to assist me because uh, I, I kind of am a one-person show. So it would get helpful to get more eyes that are trained to at least identify uh, any new areas, um, which would be very helpful to me. Um, again, uh, we might possibly do a small-scale BTK project via ground application and some small test areas. But we don't want to, we're not going to go anything big, but we want to see the effectiveness of some treatments maybe um, for maybe potentially doing on a broader landscape level. Um, and then the, re the researcher from U UNR, you know, like I said, submitted a proposal. They're still waiting on the reply from the funding um, since it is federal, federal money. Um, there's a bit of a delay apparently from just the issues with the federal budget and the continuing resolution that they continue, we continue to have with our federal budget and they're not really you know setting the money aside and since it's not a set budget yet so it's kind of on hold right now until that gets worked out so the possibility of getting the study done may or may not happen this year although we've talked about amongst our group we as state agencies we might be able to fund the grant and just have to be um, funded in a different manner than what the proposal was for. And then um, I'll also be working with the U.S. Forest Service with Forest Health Protection in Region 4 and Region 5 uh, to see if they'd be willing to, um, if they had any funding to maybe where we could do either a project or, or a monitoring project or a treatment project. But again, anything related to that would require NEPA. But um, that's right now our plans. Um, once we know more about the proposal from the researcher, that'll also help develop um, some strategies based on the research that they're going to do over a three-year time period. Um, and that's pretty much my last slide. Um, and like I said, I kept this short and sweet. Um, try to open it up to questions for the rest of the yeah. time. We have about a half hour, so. There's a lot of questions, so. Um, okay. It might be, I don't know if it might be useful for you to open up your Q&A window so you can see them, um, but I'll read, I'll just sort of start from the top and then um, we can tag team them together. But Aaron asked, has there been any moth infestations on the California side of the lake to your knowledge? Um, some minor infestations were noted on the lake on the south, the west side of the lake. Um, talking with Forest Health Protection out of Region 5, they've noted uh, satin moth infestations not only in Lake Tahoe in the last five to ten years, but up uh, north towards Susanville on the Plumas National Forest. 
Um, so it's been around as well, but uh, just some small infestations uh, on the California side right now. Okay. Um, Brian Van Winkle asked, what role, if any, would fire play in managing populations of this moth? For instance, would prescription prescribed or managing fire smoke desiccate the eggs? Well, that would be potentially, but when they're laying eggs, that's still kind of in the heat of the of a fire season for the western part of Nevada and northern California. Um, so the, the ability to do that would be very difficult. Although, and that was that has been discussed, and I think there would be some application to it. But the ability to do it based on the timing of the year would make it very not very feasible to complete something along those lines. It seems like the tourism industry might be interested in um, at least helping partner with this, these treatments or, comp, you know, sort of getting on, in on the front end of it. Have you had any interest from them at all? Um, not yet. I've, I've done some interviews with uh, some, you know, local media, radio stations and whatnot, but uh, no, no real outreach from them saying, hey, how can we get involved? Or how can we help you track this if we see something wrong with the trees? It's more about getting uh, more our ability. You know, I don't think a lot of um, tourism or the public even know that there's people like myself or others that this is the kind of work we do and they don't know who to contact. So I'll be working on that as well. Uh, on our NDF website, we have our fact sheets and our press releases and we try to get them out to the local media to get them involved. I see now why you're partnering with Heidi. Yep. That's good to uh, have extension involved. Yeah, in an extension office is, has been very good. Thanks for reminding me that, you know, working with Heidi Kratz here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> she's very helpful and she has more outlets to get, get the word out. Yeah. So. Gail asked, um, how long has it been at Marlette Lake? Have you done any cooperative surveys with the state entomologist on the predatory wasp? that was controlling them in Spooner Summit, probably need a very special lure to attract these wasps. Yeah, hi Gail. She, the, Gail's actually my predecessor in the position I took over for her four years ago, so she's uh, pretty well informed on this, but uh, hey, um, really the first uh, impacts, Gail, for Marlette Lake were noted this year. We didn't have any indications last year, um, so it was quite a surprise at how it made such a quick jump and spread. But that leads me to say that it was probably there last year. We just didn't see it, um, and it was minor, um, but definitely exploded this year. Um, and you're definitely right about uh, uh, special lures. If we do anything about the, the wasp and everything, and I've been working with Department of Ag um, on trying to get figure out what we might be able to do for further monitoring and uh, specifically about that wasp. But um, the hard part for us is also just getting the, the right lures because initially, you know, I know in the past it was just a standard gypsy moth lure, but uh, we had to switch to something that is more specific for this type of moth. So I know I didn't quite answer your question, but uh, that's kind of where I'm at with Department of Ag. Um, Joseph Kowalski asked, does the larvae eat any other trees outside of the willow family? Not that I've... I've read myself, you know, in the research I've done, we're mainly dealing with, you know, obviously quaking aspen, the native cottonwoods, and the willow species within uh, the region here. I'm not seeing it spread to anything else yet. Holly asked, um, you mentioned aspen and hardwood species. Is the satin moth species specific? What tree species might be affected? Is equal, and then she had a asked another question, is ecological range of satin moth restricted to higher elevations or is there risk to eventual migration into lower elevations, valley floors where residential trees might be at risk? You know, I think I answered the first part of her question uh, with the species, but uh, definitely it's not restricted to higher elevations. After we put out the first press release last year, I was getting reports of the moth from the public down in the valleys in Carson City, uh, outside north of Carson City in Washoe Valley, uh, Reno, Nevada. I've had reports and I've verified them in an area called Oravada, Nevada, which is down on the valley floor in a really dry climate affecting 
in a very small town uh, found in um, in some of the shade trees throughout town. Winnemucca, Nevada, same thing. So it's it's not restricted to higher elevations. Steve McKelvey asked, do the moths target any size class uh, first? Um, I haven't noticed any specific size class. They're pretty much going, they're pretty much defoliating all size classes. It doesn't matter. And that's the thing you would think, if they have a major defoliation event, we have mortality, and you have a, you know, trees uh, from root suckering and they re-sprout and they get to a certain size, the satin moth will just nail nail those trees that are naturally regenerating. So it's it's pretty much any size class. Yeah. Um, Bruce Barr asked, have you contacted TRPA about possible regulatory regulatory issues? Can you the, I don't sorry, what's TRPA? The Tahoe that stands for the Tahoe Regional Planning Authority. Uh -huh. And they're a regulatory board that deals with not, not only just zoning for housing and everything, but a lot of environmental restrictions related to water, forestry practices, um, you, know, you know, smoke, smoke impacts from burning, kind of you name it. And I have spoken to one of their foresters, and I know they were recently retired. Um, about regulatory issues, because yeah, if we did spray, there'd probably be some permitting that we'd have to get. But that's as much as that I know we would have to do is getting to STEM on board, but definitely be a partner in it along with uh, all the other state agencies. Dan Tinker is from Laramie, Wyoming. He says they have been fighting the moths for the past three years with little success. Any other reports of their occurrence in his area? Their weed and pest folks for their county have little knowledge about this moth. Uh, I know that the moth was found in Wyoming a number of years back. I haven't heard of any successes or um, any new reports. I don't, I'd, I'd be curious to know where, where they're finding it in the state, um, just, uh, just for personal knowledge, but I, I don't have any new information for Wyoming. Okay, I can put your email back in the in the chat window so folks can email you directly if you have any if they have any questions or want to answer those questions for you. Um, Glenn, yeah, go that ahead. Would be, that, well, that would be great. I was going to say at the end of that present this presentation would be um, put that out there so if people want to email me directly. They could. So that's yeah, great. No problem. No. Um, Glenn is from Saskatchewan, and um, he told he said that. I don't know how you say it, Dipyl, Dipyl is a BTK-based bacteria commonly used to control Lepidoptera here in Saskatchewan in the urban environment. Mm -hmm. So, Well, hey, that's great information. I'll, with my contact, I'll talk to them about this, this particular product. Cool. Um, and asked, how much longer has it been in British Columbia, and what do we know from what has happened there thus far? For example, natural cyclical population crashes, birds as controllers, tree mortality. Is it too early to tell? Well, and I believe um, the first introduction was back in the 19, like I said, in the 1920s. And it was in the Northwest United States, either uh, Washington State or Southern British Columbia. I don't have information on how they're doing with that issue, uh, with the population and the, you know, the physical nature, but I've known and through research, it seems like it, every three to five years you get a kind of a, uh, increase in the population and then a crash. Um, but I don't have any specific information for British Columbia. I'm sorry. Um, Holly asked, and I have the same question. It, it, it just seems, nuts how fast this has happened and maybe it's just because we're not you know in, in you know engrossed in it like you are but why has the population increased so suddenly is there a concern for spreading outside of this area i talked with uh, my, the state entomologist from the nevada department of agriculture because i had the same question you know what contributed that the only thing that we we kind of came up with uh, more of a hypothesis than anything is that in 2016-17, we had a very good winter, finally, in the um, Tahoe Basin uh, and in, in the west itself. Uh, actually, like one of the highest winters ever for snow and just precipitation. And although that doesn't seem like it would affect insects, 
I mean, it definitely the trees benefited from it, um, taking us out of drought. But um, and I don't know if that did anything to the the populations that it just didn't get the since we didn't have very very cold temperatures, which might help also control um, the moth overwintering. You know, if it gets down really cold, um, you know, zero degrees or below zero, maybe we get we might get some kill just in the winter time and just since we had so much moisture and the conditions were a little more moderate and we had all the snow and precip um, that was kind of, a, kind of a hypothesis but no real understanding of it uh, why all of a sudden it just increased like that um, and I think the second part of the question is where am I are concerned for spread yeah yeah um, yeah we're concerned it's spreading throughout the basin on a quick pace to where you're going to start seeing it um, really starting to show damage basin wide. Um, like I said, it's already in the state of Nevada throughout, but um, not all the stands are as large, uh, you know, large and acreage amounts until you get into the central part of the state and different different parts of the state that have large aspen stands. But definitely, there's concern for the Tahoe Basin area. Um, Steve asks, do you fly aerial surveys on the north side of Mount Rose, and if so? Have you detected any defoliation of aspen there? Uh, they do fly the aerial surveys, uh, and we do fly north of Mount Rose. And so far, we didn't find any indications um, in that, you know, basically north of uh, Mount Rose Highway, um, since it sounds like they're local. So right now, it's con contained in that area, more toward the state park to the south. Okay. Um, as long as you're still good, we have 12 more questions to get through. So should we keep going? Yeah. Great. Okay. Ron Levinson asked, what is the potential, potential range for this moth to spread, for example, hardiness and ability to travel? Um, well, the p potential range is it could be anywhere in the West that has uh, native aspen and, or cottonwood stands. I mean, it, it came in on the Northwest United States. It's over the years, it took its time, but it made it all the way down the California coast and made it into the interior of Nevada. We know it's in Wyoming. We know it's in Utah. Um, so I think any other states like Idaho, that uh, my counterpart part in Idaho hasn't seen it yet, but that's it, they have the same type of stands that we have. Uh, Montana, uh, the Southwest could potentially. My only thought was it potentially might be a little more difficult just because the, the, the southwest is maybe just even drier climate than Nevada, but that's just another hypothesis of mine. But I haven't gotten any word about Arizona or, or New Mexico being affected by this insect yet. Um, okay. So I think the range is west wide. So. Probably not the answer that people wanted to hear. Right, probably uh, not what people want to hear, no. Yeah. Um, Judy asked, and, and I don't know if you have the ability to do this, but she would like to see any photographs um, of the moth uh, for us to ID. So I don't, do you have any pictures readily available on your computer you could share your? Well, you unfortunately, I, I'm not on my oh, computer. Yeah, that's right. I, we don't, my, our office doesn't have the technology, but again, if I can, um, I, Megan, I can email you some close-up shots of the moth. Yeah, why don't you do that? And then um, folks that have tuned in today, if you join if you join our email list, I send about two emails a month. And so I'll have um, a link in, in the next mass email that I send out, a link to Jean's talk um, on our website. And then I'll also include, um, I have the ability to include like a little link to some files. So if you send me those, Gene, people can just easily click on them, or else I can just send them to your website if you have a, a better spot on your website. So whatever, whatever's easiest. I'll, I'll probably just send you some photographs. It'd okay. Be, that'll actually be easier, and I'll get that done today. Cool. And um, Glenn Chernick asked, has there been any research done on how satin moth populations fluctuate with drought or climate change? That's part of the problem, Glenn. There really hasn't been a lot of research done on white satin moth. You know, a lot of the focus in the United States and, you know, of course, and necessary, you know, basically European and Asian gypsy moth, those have really been the, the focus and the damage that they can cause. So satin moth has kind of been ignored. Um, my only supposition, when I came to the state in 2014, we were in heavy drought and we were still dealing with the satin moth, but the populations weren't very, very high. 
So it could be potentially when we come out of a drought, maybe populations might increase. But again, there's been really no research on that. And that's part of what the study from the UNR researcher is going to be looking into. Who's the researcher? Uh, her name is Sarah Bisbing. Okay. And is she a grad student or no? No, she's an associate professor. Okay. Um, and Great. she's new and she got onto this topic just through some of our pest alerts and neighboring in California and is very interested in doing a study. So that's why Great. she put the proposal in. Cool. Ron asked what landscape species are you seeing these feeding on? I'm not sure if he's specifically talking like urban landscape species or? Well, I can say, you know, definitely the forest landscape is definitely being affected. All the reports that I received down in Carson City um, and Washoe Valley and Reno, what they were observing, and I had to really differentiate just from the common, you know, nighttime moths that you see flying around a light versus satin moth. I, I did some many site visits last uh, summer and fall, just uh, here, where he, you know, I went and actually looked at the moth to get positive ID. I had a lot of false IDs, um, but where I did have a few positive IDs of the satin moth in the urban landscape, um, it really wasn't affecting the trees. You know, there was, they only had one or two aspen trees in their yard. So it, it wasn't much of a uh, threat to the one or two trees because it's not really a forest stand. So I think the threat to non forest lands, maybe in a more urban setting, maybe not in like Lake, T Lake Tahoe is in the forest landscape. But when you get down into more of the typical city urban landscapes, I think it won't be as big a problem, but I, I won't rule that out either. You know, I never like to make any definite, you know, definitive statements because the insects are going to do what they want to do. Right. Um, before we answer any more questions, I'm just going to launch a quick poll. Um, we, we collect this data at the end of every webinar. It helps us sort of do our job better and find out what people are interested in learning about. So I'm going to launch the poll right now. Just go ahead and take it and uh, move it out of the way so you can keep engaged, stay engaged with Gene as we answer these last 10 questions here. Um, hopefully, hopefully we can get through them in the last 12 minutes. Meredith asks, speaking of tourists and the potential for spreading this pest, do these insects lay eggs on vehicles like the gypsy moth? This would spread the pest more quickly, obviously. Um, um, good question. So far, we haven't really found anything on vehicles or um, like that. I have seen it on like sheds or buildings, you know, the egg masses, but so far not on vehicles. And that would change a whole type of different protocols that we would have uh, just through the state Nevada Department of Ag. Um, because I remember when I moved from the East Coast to the West Coast, my car got in inspected to the state I moved to um, for that. And if it, we start finding it potentially on vehicles, then we, we definitely want to start doing something different within the state. Gail said, I looked up at Snow Valley and Marlette in 2013, and there was none in either place then as well, just FYI. Let me know if you need a hand with anything. Copy that, and uh, thanks for the offer, Gail. Okay. Will, Will Richard says, I'm curious to know more about the UNR proposal, who's the professor, and what wildlife impacts in particular they hope to investigate. So you, you said her name, but maybe you can say it again, and I'll put it in the, I'll put it in the pod here. Her name is Sarah Bisbing, B-I-S-B-I-N-G. Okay. Um, sounds good. Do you know more about the wildlife impacts that they're going to be investigating or no? Uh, no, just what the basic proposal said, and um, it, it didn't get into too much detail on that. They're really looking at the comparison between stands that are not currently affected versus stands that are being damaged, and they're looking at the you know, a lot of the genetic uh, makeup of the stands. They're going to be looking at the, the genetics of the, of the clones, um, as well as looking at soil nutrient, you know, what the soil nutrient makeup is and levels, um, effects to the vegetation, effects to uh, the water table, um, and then a little bit of the wildlife impact. But I didn't, I don't have that proposal memorized, I'm sorry, but um, we'll be studying that. But the Department of Fish and Game for Nevada is going to be looking at it. Um, they're going to do some 
more monitoring even on top of what I'm going to be doing because they're concerned about raptors and or songbirds is a uh, significant concern for them. Okay. Judy asks, will BTK be available for private use on landscape trees? Do you know? Uh, BTK is one well, of the products I've looked at is restricted use and it's not available for the, the public. Um, and the ability for them to apply it themselves would be very restrictive as well. Um, it's just better left hand and professional applicators. Okay. Gail chimed in about um, what species she's seen it on. She's seen it on white poplar, salix, and other populous species. Um, fed larvae white poplar, and it did white poplar, and it did very well on that species as well as salix. So. Okay. Um, Brian asked, it may be too early, but are you seeing sprouting from the impacted stands? Um, still too early. I mean, we're still on, we just had a major snowstorm finally, and we're definitely in the middle of winter still. So are us too. <laughs> <laughs> Darley, um, Jepson asked, for monitoring the spread of this moth into the greater Tahoe Basin, do you need homeowners to put out traps to determine when this moth spreads, I have a second home near Kings Beach and would happy to assist in this. Uh, that's a possibility. Um, right now I'm trying to keep it within a few air miles. Um, but that's, you know, to do something on a private landowner, I'd have to get uh, an agreement in place. Um, but that, that is potential. I, I, I would, wouldn't mind having some additional eyes out there and um, only thing, the more traps I put out, the more that I have to manage. And it, uh, again, I have, I'm going to be getting some assistance this year, but that the more I put out, I have difficulties in keeping up with just replacing them and changing them out. So I might, if a landowner's interested, I might get them to help me lear learn how to replace a trap and collect one and, and help me. So, and I'll just come get the, uh, the trap that's been out for a few weeks and, uh, get their assistance with that if they're willing to help me with that too. So, so um, Darley, Gene's email is in the chat window. So if you click on the bottom of your screen, you'll be able to see his email there just so you can stay in touch. Um, we do a fair amount of citizen science collection um, here in Utah as, as far as water goes. So um, just an idea, I can put you in touch with those people if, if you're interested in that, Gene. Um, sure. Uh, Glenn asked, or Glenn said, Regina is in a zone three area. Would satin, would satin moth thrive in such a cold area? I'm, I'm not totally sure. You know what? I know it could, the cold temperatures could affect its overwintering because it is just under, it's, it is overwintering just underneath the bark and under usually some debris or detritus of some kind. So it doesn't have a lot of protection from the cold air. So I would think uh, a colder, harsh climate might be another tool or, or just another advantage to help preventing its uh, spread. It doesn't mean that it couldn't show up in that kind of climate, but I would think right now it might not have such a spread potential. So, but again, that's just uh, kind of my thoughts. Okay. Um, and then Holly said, I assume that any sighting of satin moth should be reported to Jeff Knight. Who's Jeff Knight? Jeff Knight is our, our state entomologist for northern, basically the state entomologist for Nevada Department of Ag. And my, uh, him, myself, or him would be the people to contact and let, let us know. Okay. Well, that was our last question. Um, if there's any other questions, feel free to chime in. Um, before you all check out of this great webinar, please um, take the, the quick poll that has been launched on your screen, and um, that helps me do my job better. Gail asked, did, did you find white satin moth on, wait, oh, she said she did find white satin moth on vehicles and at gas stations with large lights in Minden, Nevada. Okay. What? I guess my question, were they egg masses or they were just, uh, or just moths flying around on and landing on vehicles? That'd be my one question. She might, she might chime in moths and landing. Okay. Said. All right. So yeah, that's, that's a concern, but until I get some, ver some verified report uh, or I can see it or somebody takes a picture and I know Gail will be 
she'll be interested definitely in doing that. You know, if I if I find it, that's going to be a concern for me. Yeah. Okay. Well, somehow this uh, year has been the the year of insect pest and disease webinars here at Utah State University. So I appreciate you tuning in and uh, giving our our March Learn at Lunch webinar on the white satin moth and. Um, Thank you, Jean. If, if anybody has questions, uh, grab his email and send him send him uh, any questions you might have that we didn't get addressed, and he will send me some identification images that I'll put on our website. And um, thanks, thanks everyone for tuning in, and please take the poll before you you leave. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jean. All right.